Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Taylor McPartland. I'm the CEO of Scale Health. And we are beyond excited to be partnering up with the Inland Empire Health Plan for this amazing, amazing challenge focused on four key areas um, where Scale Health and IEHP are looking to drive innovation. Um, this is the third of four uh, webinars designed to help all of you really understand where um, IEHP is focused and really understand the the uh, the crux of the, and the operational process of this challenge. Today's webinar is focused on the area of member redetermination and retention. Um, and so I know we're getting out started a little bit late here. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. Um, and I'd like to hand the floor over to our partner at IEHP, Jeff Pierce, who is the Director of Innovation and Acceleration. Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining. And again, apologies for um, starting a little bit late, um, but I hope you find it informative. So um, my name, like, like Taylor mentioned, my name is Jeff Pierce. I'm uh, excited and privileged to be uh, the Director of Innovation Acceleration here at IHP. Um, my role here, among other things, um, bringing internal and external uh, innovative thinking, fostering innovation, um, building a repeatable discipline, um, and you know, towards the quality care and health outcomes of our members. So for a bit of background on IHP, um, we're a mission-driven organization to heal and inspire the human spirit, launched in 1996, um, starting out with only 62,000 members. And then since then have grown into uh, the largest not-for-profit Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid plan in the country with over 1.6 million members. Um, and as this topic suggests, we're looking to do everything we can to, to keep our members um, as well as, you know, keep them, um, keep them focused on our, uh, on their healthcare and even understand ways to grow our membership. So, um, really looking forward to what you and your companies can bring to the, bring to the table to help us do that. Um, this particular challenge, um, was brought about because we strive to continue our commitment to members, providers, partners, and each other. Um, and it's an opportunity to, you know, expand not only what we're doing today and what you'll hear about, um, a lot of the great strategies and and work that the teams are doing to um, make sure we're maximizing our membership. But we also want to bring uh, new thinking, new technology, new processes, perhaps, um, and quality of care. Is, you know, is a major focus of ours. So you'll you'll hear about um, about about that today. This is all focused on on quality as well as um, membership. So I'll leave you in the hands of our mediators in just a second. Um, but before I do, I want to highlight a couple things that. Uh, I've said to several of you that you might be um, um, on our previous calls, but one um, is placing our members at the center of our universe. So I want you to focus on that. I want to make sure we're, we're thinking of that at all times. And number two, it's unleashing our creati creativity and courage uh, to improve health and well-being. Um, so with that, thanks. And I'll uh, pass it back over to Taylor. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and, and just as a reminder for everyone, if you've been a part of the challenge or the, the webinars in the past and you're continuing to go through um, the various stages of this challenge, please um, feel free to use this time to bring questions to us and you can ask us questions directly in the chat here. Um, if you're new to this challenge process and if you've joined us in the last week or so, um, please remember to complete every aspect of the challenge. Um, to put yourself in the, in the best possible position to go through this journey. Um, and so with that, um, again, remember any questions that come up over the course of the next 45 minutes, please drop them in the chat. We'll get to them towards the end. And with that, I'm excited to hand it over to our moderator for the day, um, the head of partner success at Scale Health, Kat Karimi. Great. Thank you so much, Taylor. And I appreciate, Jeff, you, um, your introductory remarks as well. Um, I'm Kat Kramey. I had a part, uh, partner success here at Scale Health. Um, excited to uh, be part of this third webinar for the IEHB Innovation Challenge. Um, with us, we have uh, Thomas Fan uh, joining us. Uh, he is VP of Strategy at IEHP. Um, so Thomas, thank you so much for taking your time out this afternoon. Um, and I know if we get a chance, Shalon Jones, who is the Director of Member Eligibility, may be trying to join us as well. Um, 
but in the interest of time, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, Thomas, uh, let's start out with just having you introduce yourself and your role at IEHB. Hello, Kat. Hello, all. Uh, happy Tuesday to everyone. Uh, great afternoon. Uh, it's a great way to start the afternoon with, you know, having this webinar, connect with you all, and, 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 and uh, looking forward to hear, you know, the, your idea uh, on uh, medical redetermination. So my name is Thomas Van VP Strategy. So um, uh, uh, my role at IHB, I facilitate the development and implementation of our short-term and long-term strategic plan including the membership growth. Uh, and part of the membership growth is we need to retain the member uh, who we have today. And as you all know, um, um, the whole Medicaid redetermination uh, happening uh, nationwide, right? Because during the last three years during the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the county and, and the state, literally it, it put on hold of uh, most of the disenrollment uh, for the Medicaid program. So that Medicaid redetermination restart um, uh, on April 1 with the first edition Roman day of July 1. So um, uh, I'm leading the effort with Salon Joan across the organization as well as with our partner provider community try to help our member retain that eligibility. Thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, I was going to kind of ask you, why is this particularly, why is this conversation important right now? Why is it particularly relevant? And I think you you went ahead and answered that. And um, so for everyone's awareness that, you know, and, and if you're not familiar, um, there are some changes, as Thomas mentioned, that are, that just took effect recently, um, which is really the impetus behind uh, this particular challenge category. Um, it's not just around retention and uh, enrollment, um, but really the redetermination factor that's particularly relevant right now. Um, and we'll, we'll double click on that in a little bit um, later in our conversation, but in your role in strategy and member engagement, what keeps you up at night? Um, the A member that couldn't keep the eligibility because of the procedure uh, mm -hmm. uh, reason, for example, for the last three years. They don't have to do anything, right? They they keep continue stay on with the Medicaid because the whole uh, the public health emergency um, uh, uh, policy that the state have to keep them on Medicaid during that that three year window. So you know, last three years they don't have any, to do anything, and they still be able to keep their Medicaid eligibility. And now it matters. Now if they don't do anything, it matters that they may lose that eligibility, even though they may be lightly, very lightly, they qualify for it. So keep me up at night if they can't keep that eligibility, they can't see the doctor, they can't get their medication, they in the active treatment, and, 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 and they're not even aware that they need to do something now. So given, given those concerns, given that very real uh, circumstances at hand right now, um, what does success look like to you? Um, everyone who eligible for it, able to stay on the program. So, you know, at, at you may hear statistic across the, the nation, right? So you have CMS issues out some estimate. They estimate about, you know, 10 to 15 million people nationwide will lose the coverage. California estimate about two to three million people will lose coverage because Medi-Cal a Medicaid redetermination. So a lot of member or Medica, Medicaid and Goalie are at risk of losing the health coverage if you know we don't do anything or 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 um or if they don't do anything. Right. So then in your eyes then success is making sure that anyone who is eligible is enrolled or you know re-enrolled in, in their yeah. coverage. Right. Yeah. Um Understood. And I don't know if, it's, if you can take a moment and just like explain for our audience, what does that redetermination process look like for a member? Yeah. So according to the Medicaid policy, everyone will have to go through the annual eligibility determination. That means during that, you know, after when they get in Medicaid, they have 12 months to keep that eligibility. 
And on that mark of the, the annual anniversary, they will have to resubmit their documentation, including the mostly income, right? So to verify the income and they have to complete the, uh, the medical renewal application. So they have to go through that. So the annual redetermination is not happening for everyone all at once. So it happened based on their annual redetermination date. So it means 12 months, right? So mm -hmm. every month they have to go, you know, their different group will be will have to go through that. And um, you know, according to the uh, depending on the state, but in California, that California have a really, I have to to give kudos to our, you know, leadership at the Department of Healthcare Services in our county that um, they, they have innovative uh, program uh, out there that at every month that they batch the Medicaid enrollee data, income data with the federal data hub and mm -hmm. try to get that data match. So where, whenever they see that data match, those population will be auto enrolled. They don't have to do anything. So they call, you know, they auto renew because that's a data match because they found income tax or whatever they do that there is the data match, you know, the income that the county has on file and the federal has on, on their, their record. So about, you know, for uh, our two county, Riverside, San Bernardino County uh, called Inland Empire region in uh, California, that the auto renewal rate is about 40%. So 40% of the population automatically get renewed. They don't have to do anything. All they do is they get a letter on the mail and say, congratulations, you get another year, right? Mm -hmm. The other 60% will be a little challenge. The other 60% that they have to go through a manual redetermination process. That means they will get a, an application, a print application enclosed in the yellow envelope that they get mailed uh, to their mailbox. And when they get that, you know, it, uh, hopefully they pay attention to their mail. Right? Uh, unlike many of us, it may go into, you know, different place, not really on the table, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, it get their attention, they get the, um, the application. So at the point of getting the application on the mail, there are many ways for them to get renewed. One, they can complete that manual application themselves, the print application themselves and mail it in. Or they can do it online because in a way that the state have benefitcount.com where they can go there, even though they get the application in the mail, but they can go to the online portal and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Or they can walk into the county office, the local office, the, the county Medicaid office, Medicaid office and get assistance to complete it and turn it in. Or they can call IHB. Right, or we can call, we will call them as well to help them complete the application and they mail it in. So multiple way for them to, um, uh, to complete that application. Thank you. I mean, that's, it's really helpful for the audience to understand kind of what, what's the challenge in getting uh, members to be able to re-enroll and what does that process look like? Because some of the challenges may be an access issue or it may be, you, that they're not checking their their inbox, um, their uh, mailbox rather. Um, that is going to their uh, their their uh, actual uh, junk mail, if you will, um, not their junk box. Um, so, so and the question came up, and, and and I'll probably wait till the end to answer the majority of the questions. But just for clarity, um, Dave asked, you know, what geography is covered by IHP, and you mentioned it's the Riverside and San Bernardino counties in Southern California. So I realize there may be some folks on um, in the audience that aren't based in California; um, they might be anywhere in the nation, yeah. but interested in addressing this challenge. Um, so, so thank you for that question, Dave. And uh, just wanted to make sure that that was clear for folks. And actually, it's a good question because at San Bernardino and Riverside County, collectively, we call it Inland and High Region. For those who are not living in California, that you 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 uh, you may know may not know about that. Our region, we have the two largest county in the nation geography wide. So the total geography is about 27,000 um, uh, miles. So it's it, uh, um, uh, um, uh, so it the largest two county. 
and it includes you know six core regions, but 50% of people are living on that I call it urban, you know, like um uh area, but the other 50% of, of the geography, it literally is very extremely rural. So you see deserts, you see mountain, uh very uh very few of our members live in those regions. And they are more at risk of losing the coverage when they're living in that extreme rural area. That's really helpful. Thank you for that further clarification. Um, and thank you, Jeff, for answering these questions uh, in real time in the chat. So, uh, uh, and we'll make sure to uh, make sure to post these questions as well, so everyone has access to the answers. Um, so you you touched on this, and I'm I'm gonna skip around a little bit here. You started to touch on the numbers, and I think people are are pretty interested in that. Um, if we can bring up the slide, um, you know, you, you talked about the forty percent auto uh, enrolling, um, and uh, the other sixty percent that actually have to manually, whether it be by mail or phone call or email, um, uh, auto um, to to renew their their application. Um, we have some metrics around the um, disenrollment rates. Um, so if we can pull that up quickly. Um, So I'll just take a moment. Um, you know, kind of Inland Empire uh, health plan vis-a-vis -vis the state. Um, do you mind diving into these numbers a little bit more, Thomas? Yeah, so we have one month of data so far. So I think it's too early to tell about any trend, right? So uh, the first edition enrollment happened uh, effective July 1. So according to State of California Department of Healthcare Services, the statewide disenrollment rate due to redetermination only. So we only focus on re. There are many reasons for disenrollment, but for this, we just focus on due to um, redetermination uh, reason. Statewide is about twenty one percent. So twenty one percent. That's, that's uh, um, and uh, and for our two county. Uh, for our region, our addition enrollment rate is lower than the statewide average. So we are at about, you know, 18%. And, and at the time progress, because even the population that, that get, our member get addition role on July 1, they have 90 days, 90 days to cure their application, to cure their eligibility. That means during that 90 day window, they have opportunity to submit documentation or the renewal application in, and they will get reinstated. Mm. So for example, during the month of July already, you know, our reinstatement, uh, so during July, we, we lost about 17,000 member out of, you know, 100,000 member, right? So 17,000 lose the, um, uh, the eligibility effective July 1. But at the July progress forward, we have been able to restate about 4,000 members already. So mm -hmm. our restatement, so our members are coming back because you know we, we have you know the team here that reach out to our member who are on hold for that window and try to get them back on. So for one month alone, we're able to get about I think 3,000 to 4,000 already uh, uh, July. So we still have August and September to bring the population who is shown on July 1 back into the plant. So am I clear then that this one in effect April 1, so that 90 days to cure their enrollment, the first time that 90 days kind of period expired, if you will, was July 1. And so that's uh, why they were disenrolled effective July 1? Actually, April 1 is when the county mail the renewal application for individual who have a June 30th renewed due date. So seriously, they may minimum of two plus months in advance. July 1 is the first time, it was the first day that the population will get the Shinro. And so the 90 day window is counting from July 1. So you have July, you know, right, right? So the first month will be August 1, August. 
then September and October. So really those yeah. three months is the clear period for the July one mission enrollment population. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and so on a rolling basis, based on their redetermination uh, anniversary, their enrollment anniversary, then the, they'll continue to, on a rolling basis, um, be disenrolled if they don't action on it. Yeah. Got it. Um, and then success to you then would be to take that 18% disenrollment rate in July and bring that down to zero. It, yes, the, so that's the ideal. That's the ideal state. <laughs> um, all right. So um, are there any particular pain points that, and we, we've touched on a couple of them already, but there, are there any particular pain points that you think can attribute to the the uh, disenrollment or, you know, is it, is it an access issue? Is it an engagement issue? In your yeah, estimation, so, what do you think? Yeah, I think that couple uh, uh, pain point that according, you know, from for, for uh, seeing we help our members in uh, uh, April one to now. So a few pain point, pain point number one, ability to get a hold of a member. Right, so when we outreach our member, help them to uh, complete the, the the renewal application, our success rate is about thirty to thirty five percent. So the the um, uh, uh, majority, a two third of it, we couldn't get a hold of. So it requires multiple attempt to 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 get to our member. So that number one ability to get a hold of. Every single one we get a hold of they very happy to get our assistance. So the minute we get hold of them, we don't have an issue of help them complete the process. So that so the second pain point is that we have more demand than we can afford to like uh, more demand than supply. So we have more demand than the resources that we have. So even though you know we hire uh, a team of eligibility, we bring a brand new team, eligibility team of 50 people, 5-0, to help our member. So we invest into the brand new team who every day outbound call to our member, help them renew, right? And thinking about the demand. So July, that you know, uh, if we talk about, um, let's say uh, uh, today, August 1, August 1, for the month of August, we are working on helping our member with a September renewal due date, right? Because we get the file 60 day in advance. So we work on that population. So that population about 70,000 members, right? A second group if we are working with the July 1 edition role population to get them back into the program. So you have an overlap population already, mm -hmm. right? And then moving to September, then you have the edition enrollment of August 1 plus the July 1 edition enrollment and then the September renewal population. And then you have October renewal population. So every month passing by, we have more population adding to or outbound call it. And the, so we have more demand than supply, right? Than resource to do. Mm. And is so all that, your, sorry to interrupt. I have a follow-up question, but I also wanted to take a moment. Shalon Jones is in the house. Um, <laughs> I want to say thank you. Yes, I want to take an opportunity to just introduce her. Um, uh, and I know I, 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 you know, I realize you had some technical difficulties um, this afternoon, but um, Shalon, if you just want to take a moment to introduce yourself and your role at H, uh, IHP, uh, you're on mute. Uh, there you okay. Go. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Shalon Jones, Director of Member Eligibility at IEHP. Um, my team's primary role and my primary role is really working through initiatives that support our Medi-Cal members through um, retention, um, retention um, and ensuring that they maintain their Medi-Cal and their relationship with IEHP. Okay, great. And Thomas has been holding down the fort. Um, and being able to kind of give us some context around um, the redetermination process and why this is such an uh, important topic right now. Um, 
and we were just speaking around um, some of the pain points um, uh, that may result in uh, disenrollment. Um, and so, Charlotte, I think it's a good opportunity um, to hear your point of view on this as well. Um, I'm not sure if you got caught Thomas's response um, leading up to the introduction, but um, would be great from your perspective since you are heading up um, member enrollment uh, if uh, you have any, any additional thoughts there. Sure, and so um, what a, one of the things that um, we've identified as a pain point is, um, I think what, where Thomas was, was starting the conversation was really around demographic information and the uh, availability of a member's contact information to be able to outreach to their members to even offer the support. Medi-Cal as a program is really designed to only have a touch point with the counties once a year. And so if you couple that or layer into that a pandemic that doesn't require them to update contact information or make any eligibility changes to their Medi-Cal case over three years, that definitely adds a barrier to our ability to obtain that information. So mm -hmm. with a very, um, you know, uh, convoluted healthcare system with, you know, updating information with a, a provider versus, you know, advising someone to update their information with us as the managed care plan, as well as um, Medi-Cal as the administers of their eligibility really um, poses some challenges for outreach and ensuring that our members can get the support either from us or the counties that they may need. Understood. And so just taking what both you and Thomas just said, um, it sounds like it's a it's a, a data challenge around data on the, the members themselves and whether it be their contact information or their communication preferences. Um, and then Thomas, you mentioned, you know, kind of the more manual process of out of actually engaging and reaching out to the members um, to help them through the the re-enrollment process. Is that yeah. an accurate statement? Yeah, so, so you know, uh, the third pain point, it would mm. be a, a very fun to hear from, you know, proposal that you have, uh, that the third pain point is that when we reach out to member, right, many of them already do it themselves, but we, we don't know. We don't, we can differentiate you know, which one can mm. do it themselves, which one not. So love to hear your idea, invite you to uh, to share what your thought on that. Um, because, you know, in a way, if we, we uh, you know, uh, because limited resource, we we love to be able to talk to the right one. Mm. Okay. And help so them go through the process. Yeah. So a, a, a predict, the ability to predict and, and prioritize uh, outreach based on whatever information IHB may be able to to supply or um, provide for for a potential partner or pilot um, uh, yeah. piloting company. Um, yeah, right, Ken, and 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 uh, you know, our members, you know, they a very diverse group. We have very diverse group of membership. So we have kid only who with us parent or not with us. They are a high income group. And then you have a group of moms and kids, like, you know, working low income family, right? And then you have a childhood adult or adult with older kid who older than 21. And then the four group we have is senior and people with disability. So four very distinct group. And those four distinct group, they may react differently on the messaging. They may react differently to the mode of engagement or communication. So love to hear, you know, the thought out there on um, uh, not only predictive, but what mode uh, or what, what motivate them to, to respond better, what motivate them to, to, um, to empower them to get things done themselves, right? So that that what we're looking for as well. It would be fun to hear what idea out there. Yeah, no, this is really a helpful context. And, and the question came up that I think is very relevant to what you just said. Um, someone asked, are there language and cultural barriers um, that are a challenge during outreach? 
um, given the diversity of your population, yeah. you find that to be a pain point. So I would say as it relates to um, the outbound calls, the team supports English, Spanish, um, Mandarin, Chinese, and Vietnamese as the languages. Um, but there may be other languages that may be um, a bit of a challenge. And also through our technology and our text messaging campaign, we are only able to outreach to English and Spanish populations. So it really um, does, um, we have a disadvantage for other languages when we're using various forms of technology that may be limited in the languages that they support. Got it. Thank you for that additional context there. Um, I think for not to be leading, but you know, understanding kind of current state for IEHP is going to be helpful for um, the the innovators on the call um, as they think through uh, innovative or novel ways to either predict, prioritize, or actually engage with the members. Um, so. We kind of touched on this and 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 maybe just to reiterate since we're on the topic, um, it'd be helpful to further understand what types of outcomes you're looking for from the innovators to address around member redetermination and retention. Shalom, we'll start with you. So um, as Thomas had provided some stats around members that we are able to reach and our success rate thus far, I think, you know, we want to really expand that um, to the members that we are unable to reach and really understanding why um, are, you know, is it cultural barriers? Is it the time that we are available? Is it, um, you know, just majority of individuals feel the need, you know, we're missing the mark on individuals that may be self-sufficient enough to complete it on their own and people that may not feel comfortable with calling in and we really want to meet our members where they are. And so how do we do that effectively um, with our team and support and collaboration with the counties because the counties is doing are they're also doing a lot of outreach. Um, to the same population, but really that handheld support that IEHP can offer to its members is so crucial and so important. And we found value in that, particularly um, in our senior population and some of our members that have disabilities, they need that additional time. So we just want to make sure of that volume that we're receiving per month, which ranges anywhere right now from 70,000 to 75,000, how do you predict the best people to reach that need your services out, outside that very large population? That's really helpful. And can you give everyone, any of uh, the attendees here, an idea of what those, what those services look like? I know there's outbound calls. You mentioned some text, potentially email. But what does that actually, what does that support actually look like to get them through the process? Yeah, so as far as marketing of our team and offering the support, we do um, a direct mailer um, that lets them know that their packet is coming um, because, again, they haven't had to do this in three years. So our marketing strategy um, in some of these efforts is really walking them through the process and kind of what they could can expect. So we start off with a direct mailer, letting them know that your packet should be coming from the county any day now. Once you get that and you need help, please give IEHP a call. Then we um, follow that up with a series of text messages. And so those text messages really ask the member, did you receive your packet? It's very interactive um, and they indicate yes or no. Um, and then there's a series of canned responses if they are ready right now with their packet in hand to um, walk with an IEHP team member through that process. Um, they actually have a button where they can click and call right in to the team and get support. If they're not ready at that time, we do have a scheduler built into that campaign in which they can schedule a designated day and time in which a team member will make the call at that designated day and time. Um, we also um, are making outbound calls based upon strategies that we've identified internally as an organization um, that kind of support the membership as well. 
And so we make the outbound calls accordingly. Um, we have various data exchanges. So um, if we know a member is set for disenrollment because they haven't turned in their packet, we kind of shuffle our priorities and kind of bubble those up to the top because we know in 10 days, they're going to lose their coverage. And so there is a lot of um, coordination involved um, to ensure that we don't lose members along, along the way. I think there's there's multiple opportunities along that um, journey, if you will, um, for 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 optimization potentially. And so um, I think that is is really helpful for the audience to hear and understand, um, especially if they haven't gone through that process themselves, right? Um, uh, really understanding what is that uh, enrollment process entail? What is the support that's available um, and those resources that are available? Um, and one question that came up, and it's, it's very much in line with this, and just to reiterate something that Thomas had said earlier, um, you know, you get the mailer, you can you can submit your um, in renewal application in via uh, post, you know, post, ma uh, post mail. Um, and then there's also an online option, um, so they can submit their renewal application there. They can call in to IEHP, um, and then um, I think that, and then you're they're also getting inbound calls, right? So they're getting that that touch point as well. Um, did I miss any of those uh, ways in which an, a member can uh, s submit their renewal application? Um, they can turn it in directly to the county um, as well. That's an alternative to drop it off or go into the office there. Um, and so we aren't processing the eligibility. We're, this, we're just there to answer the members' questions if they have questions on how to fill out their form. We can actually walk them through submission if, it's, if, it's, if they're using the online portal of Benefits Cal. And so we do have various ways, but ultimately it's there to make sure that we get the member as close to a successful submission of that re renewal packet by any way that they feel comfortable. So our senior population may not necessarily be as tech savvy. So what we found in our calls is they wanna take that paper in and drop it off to the county. So we walk them through the paper. We have others that are very tech savvy and we're going through, um, we're answering maybe one or two question, clarifying questions for that member and they're able act, you know, they're actually able to hit that submit button and provide us with the confirmation that they receive. So our members spend, you know, a very, very diverse group um, of support that is also needed. And we really couldn't do this without also support from our provider community because we also share with our provider community um, and their patients who have a renewal due. So if for some reason, you know, they're engaging with a patient, um, they can say, hey, you have a renewal due, please reach out to IEHP if you haven't turned in that packet already. So in addition to our own kind of internal, there are partners that we um, leverage um, as a part of this effort. So they are aware and they can support them. You know, we can support indirectly with those provider community too. Great, and I know we had a couple of extra questions we wanted to cover, but I, I want to be mindful of time. We do have a very engaged audience, a lot of questions. Um, and, and if we don't get to all of them, we, we can follow up um, with uh, kind of a, a QA and a um, as well. But um, before we jump into the Q&A, Thomas and Shalon, any advice or final thoughts you may have for participating companies? Yeah, so uh, I, I think, at the, you know, Shalon shared uh, quite a few pain points. Also, what we're looking for, I'm just super excited to wait what's out there. Um, you know, we set uh, to be to be candid, you know, we we set very high bar for the state uh, and uh, Shalon having the road show to, you know, uh, the county she's going to go about and, and share what all health planning in California, what we do, because the result that we have, it just outperformed the statewide additional rate that you can see it, that it, we outperform everyone. Uh, the strategic advantage we have is, you know, we have innovative approach with the county where we share the data. 
we partner very closely with the county and provider. I think we second to none uh, from that aspect. Um, uh, provide the community like uh, uh, we have many story from our member that share uh, show that uh, share that when they call provider, provider check eligible and say you have to call IHB before I can make an appointment with you. You know, I don't, we don't want that provider to go that far, but uh, I just uh, we have very highly engaged provider network. Uh, to support the effort. So uh, looking forward to see a breakthrough idea on member engagement. Um, uh, how do we call the, you know, how do we know which one we need to call? Because we have more demand than we we, we can afford, right? The different mode communication, very diverse group of member. Uh, so a lot of, of, of thing that we don't know out there. I can a lot of new thing out there with, that we don't know. And I love to hear from the group. Great, thank you for that, Thomas. Sean, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yes, so um, I think it's very important to know um, in working with IEHP, um, as we kind of have been alluded, alluding to, Thomas and I, um, really our mission, vision, and values is, is so important and near and dear to us. So our mission, um, which I believe is, there we go, thank you, queued up on the screen, is we heal and inspire the human spirit. And one of our top values that I think is so important for people to know is that we place our members at the center of our universe. And so it's not just about what, what's in it for us from a retention standpoint, but really being good stewards of the work in healthcare and providing optimal care and vibrant health, um, as well as maintaining our organizational strength. And so we uh, look forward to in engaging and, and collaborating with individuals that feel the same, that are passionate, not just about the outcomes, but also the, the community that we serve. Yeah, I think that's gonna be so critical for everyone participating in this challenge um, that you know, you're really looking for a collaborative partner um in this right um less I think someone mentioned something about vendors and I, I don't even think of it I don't know how you guys feel about it but I don't even think about it as a vendor uh client relationship it's really a collaborative partner who can um you know uh, address this challenge head on um so with that uh you know we have about eight minutes left and I don't think we're going to get through all the questions um I think I can recap some of these pretty quickly um, based on the conversation that we've already had. Um, so starting from the top, um, there are some questions around, you know, what is what is kind of understood about the 60% of the members that do not get auto enrolled? Um, and uh, and, and I think that's that's part of what you guys are hoping to to understand from the innovators, right? Um, what does that demographic look like? What are who needs to be prioritized from an outreach perspective um, of, of that that sixty percent that's not auto enrolled? Um, anything else um, that you maybe all offer the audience regarding that the sixty percent that you may know about them or other considerations? So what we learned from the month one, it's only month one, I think it's too early to celebrate. And, and we have some data on month two, July and August renewal, right? And the, from the 60% population, the submission rate, so we're basing on the submission rate, the individual who actually turning something, doesn't mean they turning complete application, they turning something. It's about 80 to 85%. So it's really high in a way. Because pre-pandemic, that number were between 75 to 85. So now we are beating, we, we are beating the pre-pandemic level. So, you know, we were super proud, but I think month one. I think it's too early to tell from only one month of data <laughs> or two months of data. Uh, so um, uh, kudos but, but to Shalom the team. And, yeah. It, but even then, there's the opportunity to go from yes. that five percent of submission completion to a hundred. Hundred, hundred, right. hundred. That's so the we, idea. We, we, and we bring that, you know, the inverse of that is bringing that disenrollment rate down to zero. Understood. Got it. Okay. Yep. Um, so I think we asked the question about geography. Um, 
Um, we talked about the process currently um, for, the, to, for providing assistance that Shalon walked us through. Um, let's see here. Right, so we, yes, there's another question around assistance. What are the issues that cause the engagement rate? Oh, so this is interesting. Um, so we did talk about some of the pain points that may be leading to disenrollment. Um, this question is specific to, um, you know, are there other options in the area other than IEHP where that might be attributing to disenrollment? And is there any data around that if that is the case? So the um, what we learned from the July disenrollment most of the disenrollment reason is for failure to return an application. Mm. So that's the dominant, the, the one that due to a higher income or we call mandatory disenrollment reason like move out of county, higher income, that make up only three to 5%. So dominantly people get disenrolled because of failure of submitting something. Because when they submit something, they, they buy them, their cell, themselves more time to complete the process, right? So the failure of submit something is the number one disenrollment reason. Understood. And, okay. and Kat, can I add to that, if you don't mind, really quickly? Um, so one of the things with that, interesting enough, is that um, a person may be consciously choosing not to turn in their packet because they think they're no longer eligible. Um, and so they may just go ahead and, you know, throw away their packet thinking, you know what, I make this amount of money now, I know I'm not eligible, or I have other health care coverage, so it's no longer, so they don't allow the process to determine if they are truly ineligible or not, and so we really want them, you know, there are options, can you have dual coverage? Absolutely. Um, there are some things, so ensuring that you know these members do turn in their packet to allow the county to make that eligibility determination um, is really so important. So those numbers that Thomas just shared, um, yes, it's failed to complete redetermination, but there may be some underlying reasons in there. People may be choosing based upon their circumstance and thinking they may no longer be eligible, which right now we don't know that necessarily to be true. Got it. And so that may be an opportunity around education of, of, you know, letting people know that they can have dual coverage, that um, if there's any, I don't know, changes to eligibility criteria, that they still may be eligible, right? Um, okay, so that that's helpful. Um, information as well. Um, as you know, uh, as I imagine, innovators are uh, assessing the various uh, challenges that they may um, may need to address um, in in putting forth a solution. Um, okay, we're we're getting through these pretty quickly. Let's see here. Um, we talked about providers' role potentially in in reminding patients to re uh, re enroll. Um, in person opportunity for completion of their enrollment package. Um, it's very. Those percentage members with smart. Yeah, you know, for that question, the in person, uh, this is a part of uh, redetermination. So, in person is an option, it's not mandatory. So, they have many options. Right. Um, so, this one was answered. Has IEHP done any analysis on the percentage of members with a smartphone um, with internet access with a reliable, reliable email address? Um, we talked about one of the pain points around um, the kind of integrity around the contact information. Um, are these uh, are these attributes uh, gathered as well as part of your contact um, yes. data? Yeah, so we have information of our member who have cell phone versus landline. We um, so about 60, 70 percent of them have cell phone. And we know who member have cell phone or landline. You know, we have the, the through the texting program that our vendor, our vendor able to scoop the data and tell us exactly who has what, right? And uh, the second one is that uh, unreliable email. 
that is very limited. About 20%, I think we have information on about 15 to 20% of our member with an email address. So that number is limited because when they sign up for a mem uh, member portal, they have to add the email address. So that's how we capture the email address. Um, so it's about 15%, 10, 15%, I'm sorry, 15 to 20 too high. I think it's 10, 15%. So there may be an area for, um, dare I say, just improvement from a, a, a data perspective, right? If there's different channels or means for engagement with your members, um, email could very feasibly be one of them, but the challenge may be not having the email address for, for everyone. Um, and then is the same around, uh, so what would be the reliable uh point um, contact data that you would have for all your members? It would be the physical address, their phone number. Yes, and, and met, uh, so we have um, address provided to us by state of California, that means the county, right, from the government. The second data set that we have is when member call in and report to us. The third one is the post office the NCOA, National Change of Address. So we do that every month and scrub that data, uh, identify the member who moved but not report to us or the county. So those, um, and then the four set of the data from the provider community and, uh, you know, through the uh, HIE, you know, those, um, uh, the health chain uh, uh, platform that we're able to get some of the, those data, okay. claim data, yeah. We are at time. I, I think I got to the majority of the questions. I apologize if I missed any, um, but Thomas and Shalana, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking time in your afternoon today um, to uh, address the member redetermination and retention category for the IEHP challenge, one of four categories that are being addressed in the innovation challenge this year. Um, so, Thank you very much for your time. Um, and before we go, I think Thomas might have a few closing remarks, but uh, just wanted to thank you again. Yeah, so so thank you for giving us this uh, opportunity and uh, you know uh, uh, connecting with the audience and 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 thank you for sending so many questions here. So it's very this very engaged group. So I'm super excited. You know we. We very open and and hear what you have in your mind. I'm sure there's many excellent proposal out there. So I'm looking forward to uh, reading your proposal and idea. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Taylor. Great. Well, well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Shalon. A uh, big thank you to Kat for, for moderating an amazing session. Uh, we're going to put a couple quick links up um, here. So first off, next week, as Kat alluded to, um, next week, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific is our fourth and final webinar. It's going to be focused on, for this challenge, it's going to be focused on family um, family unit care. So if that's an area that you're interested in, um, please join us then. Um, additionally, we're going to put two more links in here. If you have not yet started um, the, the process for participating in this challenge, um, we have a link here for you to get started. You still have until August 17th and uh, to go through the process. And if you've started, but you haven't completed, again, please remember to, to complete the entire process. Um, we have a link here as well for you to go back in and, and finish out the remaining questions. Um, so as, as Thomas mentioned, we're beyond excited to see the, the interest and the excitement, the engagement. Uh, from this amazing group of innovators uh, and uh, just beyond excited to see the impact that we'll all be able to drive together moving forward. So uh, thank you again. And uh, just very quickly over to Jeff, if uh, Jeff Pierce, if he has any other questions. Or, or well, thanks, comments. Taylor. Uh, <laughs> just, just a quick thank you. I appreciate all your time, as, as Thomas mentioned and Taylor mentioned. So thanks again. And we look forward to your submissions. We'll be getting on your questions as well. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.